How's that? Yeah. All right. Maybe when you were in elementary school and high school, you had an Andrew in your class. For me, Andrew, what, I think we went to school together for about six years. And he really had two jobs. One was to say the things that all of us were afraid to say, and the other one was to do all the things that us were afraid to do. And one of my favorite Andrew moments was when we were sitting in Teacher Hashi's class. I went to a Quaker school, and in Quaker schools, you use the title teacher and the person's first name. And we were in Teacher Hashi's class, and we revered and respected and admired, and I continue to love Teacher Hashi. I'm still in touch with her. But we were in terror of her. I mean, she, she filled us with fear and trembling. And she was constantly trying to impress upon us that if we were going to be successful in life, we were going to have to stop being so silly, and we were going to have to learn self-control and discipline and the value of hard work. And she, one day, was using herself as an example, and she had been a dancer at one point. And she talked about how she trained her body and she worked all the time and she had such control over her body that she was able to use her muscles on her stomach to roll a quarter up and down her stomach. And if you're in seventh grade, this is a delicious moment for you. And so all of us are just looking down and thinking, oh, please, God, I don't want to look like I'm going to laugh. We're all going to get in so much trouble. Please, God. And Andrew, there's this deep pause of reverence for Teacher Hashi and her muscles in her stomach. And Andrew says, that's really cool. Could you make change of a five? <laughs> Andrew went to the office, and the rest of us delighted in the bounty of hilarity that Andrew had reaped for us, and he got in trouble, and we didn't. And I'm repeating this story to you now, and it's many years later. So Andrew is also the person um, who you could lean to in class and whisper in his ear and tell him to do things, and he would just do them because he had no filter. And um, he would also ask the questions that you wanted asked. So, such as, if I get a D on this test, will I still pass the class? That's one one. Or how about, how late do I have to be to be marked absent? You know, so those sorts of things. Andrew would always ask. And every time I read scripture, when we get to a part that says, and Peter said, what I hear is, and Andrew said, because that's who Peter is. Peter is the guy who will say the things to Jesus that you know you should not be saying to Jesus, because Jesus is Jesus, right? And he should know better, but he says them. They're the things you want to say, but you would never say. And he also goes and does the things that you really would like to do with Jesus, but you would never do, like going out on the water and all that stuff. So here we are again with Peter and, and Jesus, or in my mind, Andrew and Jesus. And Peter, last week, just rightly identified Jesus as the Messiah. He got it right for once. So um, he was congratulated. And this is the passage that happens right after G Peter identifying Jesus as the Messiah. What happens right afterwards is Jesus says, yes, Peter, you're right, I am the Messiah. And one would hope that there's this pause, because if he's the Messiah... That means the Roman Empire that's persecuted the Jewish people for all this time is coming down. And the Jewish people are going to win. And for us, if Jesus is the Messiah, like one of the things you might hope is South Korea, like the threat of South Korea is, is over. And all of the government-sponsored terrorism in the world, including our own, is, is over, and, you know, it's, it's, it's coming to an end, and any other organizations that are a threat 
to the you know to human beings and and all it's it's coming to a close right and because Jesus is going to win that's the hope but what Jesus says next is yes and because I'm the Messiah I am going to go to Jerusalem I am going to be um, arrested because the institutional church is going to hand me over and um, then I am going to be put to death on the cross and then I am going to rise again so Jesus shares this information the disciples look on in horror and silence and Andrew or Peter depending on how you want to do it says come over here Jesus let's caucus right so he brings Jesus over to the side and says, that can't happen. You're not going to go and die. That's not the way this is going to work. And Jesus freaks out on him. And you wonder, like the first thing that Jesus says is, get behind me, Satan. That seems a little bit extreme. I mean, Peter is concerned about Jesus because he loves Jesus and he's his friend, right? And why would Jesus say, get behind me, Satan? That seems horrifying. But here's the thing I think that Matthew, gospel, Matthew's gospel is trying to tell us. In this moment, Peter actually is speaking on behalf of Satan, knowingly or not knowingly. Probably not knowingly. Because the last time we saw Satan in the gospels, he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And what he's tempting Jesus to do is save himself, but also save the world the way that human beings know how to save the world, which is by overpowering and controlling. That's the way we do it, individually sometimes, nationally all the time. Overpowering and controlling. That's how, that's how we win. That's our understanding of what it means to succeed. And... The thing for Jesus in this moment is we always remember when we're hearing from him, he's 100% human and he's 100% divine. And one of the things I find so moving about this passage in Matthew is I think that when he loses it with Peter, it's his 100% human part coming out. And his 100% human part my friend Catherine at my old church would say, wants to get to marry Mary Magdalene and settle down and raise some kids, right? Maybe wants to have a normal life, wants to go become a fisherman or a carpenter, wants to be happy. And when Peter says, you don't really have to do this, it's true. Peter, Jesus could go to Jerusalem and overpower the Roman Empire and subdue it the way that we've always won, the way that human beings have always won. So Jesus is actually 100% human, wanting not to do what he has come to do, but he's also 100% divine. And when he tells Peter, you are thinking like a human being, you're not thinking about the things of God, I believe what he's saying is, Peter, I understand that the only way you understand how to rule the world is by overpowering and controlling. I'm telling you that's demonic. And the Son of God has come into the world to show us a different way. Which is why Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he confronts all of the powers of violence and betrayal and hatred and xenophobia and racism, you name it. He confronts them all on the cross. And he loves and he forgives. And he dies. And the thing that Peter can't hear this morning is he's resurrected. And he releases the power of love and life and forgiveness in the world that's with us here in this room this morning. And it costs him everything. I am a mother. There are parents in here, and if you're not a parent, you were once a kid. I have this reflex with roses and my kids, which is always to limit 
the possibility of pain, right? And to make sure that they are safe at all times. Poor Lucy went to take a walk the other day a mile away to have pizza and ice cream with her friends and wanted me just to leave her alone. I kept texting her. I kept, you can actually have an app on your phone now. I think it's called Find My Friends. I can find her on what street she is, right? And so, and I, I would say, I want you to call when you get to this house. I want you, when I am not in the house, what are the, I go over, they're 13 and, and, you know, 12. I go over this rule all the time. What are you going to do when I'm not home and somebody calls? I'm going to say that you're in the shower. What do I, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when somebody knocks on the door? I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer the door. I'm going to lock the door behind me. I'm going to bring my key to school. All of this stuff all the time. So I'm always limiting. I'm always limiting the possibility of pain all the time with my kids. And I remember this used to happen to me. I was told, never talk to strangers, keep the door locked, blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you what, when I got older, the most glorious, wonderful, holiest times I've ever had is when I talked to the stranger that I knew my grandfather would have told me not to talk to. And when I went to places where I did not belong, and when I unlocked my door, and when I asked the question, why? Why can't I share? Why are you telling me that this neighborhood is too dangerous for me, but it's not too dangerous for that little girl over there? How do you know that man is dangerous? Why, 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 why? And that's always been God talking to me. And every time I've listened, I've gotten so much life. Jesus said that when you try to save your life, you lose it. And when you're ready to lose your life for his sake, you gain it. So don't tell my kids yet. But I want them to go out and love in the world, and I want them to go get hurt. I want, them to, I want it to cost them something. And I want them to figure out what part of the cross they can lift themselves for Christ's sake and learn not to be safe and risk doing something holy and loving and let it cost them. Amen.